about through a lot of discussion, through a lot of time and effort and, and, and dedication with intention, we found out that the book of James was written by James. Wasn't that a great time? I mean, it took all that to figure that out. And it was so much fun. The problem was which James, okay? And it's, it's been known throughout history without much question to be the brother of James. I mean, sorry, the brother of Jesus, that James. And because it was written by that James, made the book of James very difficult to be accepted as scripture, oddly enough. Uh, because here's the thing. I told you I could give you one little random piece of trivia every week. Here's your next piece of trivia. The book of James was highly contested regarding the canon because it was not written by an original apostle or connected to an original apostle. When they were gathering and recognizing and discerning through the power of the Spirit which books of the Bible were going to make up the New Testament, as the groups were getting together and they're trying, all the leaders are trying to figure this out, most of them, most of them were without a doubt, no problem. We knew, they knew clearly it was God's Word. They knew clearly the Holy Spirit had inspired the writers, had worked with the writers. It was no question. There were just a couple of books that were kind of put into doubt for a while. Uh, the book of Revelation being one, and the book of, of Hebrews being another, and the book of James being yet another. And like I said, because James was written by Jesus' brother, not of the original 12, or a scribe of the original 12, that's why it was in question. But one of the qualifications of an apostle was to be taught by Jesus, was to have seen the resurrected Jesus, and things along those lines. And guess what James did? He fit that bill. And so they eventually accepted the whole letter of James and they got put into the New Testament because we're like, it is Jesus' brother. Jesus did appear to him. We know that he appeared to him and we, we know all of this. So therefore, yes, we're going to accept James into the canon of the 66 books of the Bible. So James ended up working its way in. But it was a little bit of a grueling little task for James. And then later we end up having our reformers like Martin Luther who wanted to actually rip James from and Revelation from the New Testament completely and wanted to change our canon. And it's interesting, when we look at Martin Luther, we hold him up so high. But yet, here's this guy that went, you know what? I don't like James and I don't like Revelation. Let's remove him. And, and so <laughs> we find out that they weren't perfect men, okay? They weren't perfect at all. But we're very grateful that, that God allowed us to have the book, this letter of James. And it's, we're just, it's just, you're going to find out how valuable this book is into the discussion of the New Testament, okay? So when we were looking at uh, Verse 1 last week, it says it was written by James, a servant of Jesus. And then he was writing to whom? Okay, here's what the second half of verse 1 says. It says, to the 12 tribes in dispersion, greetings. To the 12 tribes in the dispersion, greetings. Okay, now, there is a lot of debate over who he's writing to. I know, you're going to say it's really clear. He's writing to whom? The 12 tribes. You would think that'd be, that'd be the end of the discussion. However, James never mentions Jews or the 12 tribes again. In fact, three times throughout the book of James, he mentions the word the church. He mentions the New Testament church. He doesn't mention the Jews. So then they start wondering, like in 514, James says, you know, go and consult the elders of the church. And then have, when someone's sick and they will pray for them and they will put hands on them. And, and, and it's, it's interesting that if he's writing to Jews and the 12 tribes, it wouldn't be to the church. Because the 12 tribes, a lot of them, once they converted from Judaism to Christianity, they didn't associate themselves too much by those 12 tribes a lot. So then why mention the 12 tribes? You see, this is where the debate comes in. And a lot of it is, is a lot of academics to it. And the best argument I have ever come across is actually a Southern Baptist scholar. I, I've read through a lots of arguments, a lot of research, and the Southern Baptist scholar at Golden Gate University, that's, you know, way out west, okay? And he wrote down that what was going on was James was trying to liken the church to the 12 tribes, that he was trying to liken the church to the 12 tribes and showing them that they have something in common. That as the 12 tribes were in dispersion and were scattered abroad, so too was the church. And here's the other thing I would like to add into his discussion. That when the church started, it was predominantly made up of whom? 
Jews. There were no Gentiles in the church yet. Okay, <laughs> so he's talking to Jewish Christians, but he is wanting to talk not only to Jewish Christians, but wanting to talk in such a way that also applied to Gentile Christians as they became grafted into the church. Okay, so I, I agree with this whole concept of, hey, the church is scattered abroad, like the 12 tribes have been scattered. In fact, of the people of the 12 tribes, they didn't even know who they were. We still don't, we still don't have all the 12 tribes identified. We have like, like eight, I think. We don't, we've lost tribes because the Jews lost their ancestry. They even lost at the time James wrote, which was you know, early 50s. It's one of the first books of the New Testament written. And even by that point, they had already lost several tribes. I think two tribes were missing in a sense. They just didn't have that record. And so the, it, was, it was lost. So it's interesting. So the, James is trying to say, hey, to the Jews, which is the church, but it's about the church. And either way, whether you're part of the Jewish group or the Gentile church group, either way, you're in dispersion. Either way, you're scattered abroad. Either way, you got a group here and a group there and a group here. It's not like everybody's in one country and one land working together. And we know that's how the church is. The body of Christ is one giant family in dispersion, scattered all across the face of the earth, over all the continents. We have dispersion. So yes, James is going to be having a, some, some Jewish-type tones here at the beginning, but it's too very much Gentiles as well. It's not limited to Jews and Jews alone. It's to the church who started out Jewish, Jewish by uh, um, ethnicity, not Jewish by religion. We have to keep that in mind. When we say someone's Jewish, there's two types of Jewish. <laughs> there's those that are Jews because of uh, of ethnicity, then there are those that are Jews based upon religion. They're part of Judaism, and those people are Jews. And if somebody's not a ethnicity Jew, but they convert to Judaism, they're viewed as a Jew. Okay, that, it, so it gets complicated in our nice American minds. Okay, we like things really clear cut, straightforward, simple. You know, either it's a pizza or it's a hamburger, but don't you dare call it a pizza burger because it's going to mess it up. Okay, we, we, we like it clean and simple. Okay. Pizza burger sounds good, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I made that up. That sounds good. <laughs> Somebody call a restaurant, man, or copyright it for me. <laughs> but that sounds really, really good. So here's another thing about the book of James we all need to know before going on to verse 2. That James, as a genre, it's not technically an epistle. Even though it's called the epistle of James, it's not technically an epistle. It's not technically a letter, though it is a letter. He wrote a letter, and it is technically written as a letter, but James is actually considered to be wisdom literature. Okay, equal to that of the book of Job. Equal to that to the book of Ecclesiastes. Equal to that of the book of Proverbs. Okay, that James is the wisdom literature of the New Testament. It's the only one. Okay, all the rest of them are either epistles, are sermons, they're gospels, they're whatever. James is unique. James is wisdom literature. And what this means, first off, when we read through some of this, it's going to sound like Proverbs. Even when you go right over and, you're, and we're going to read the first couple of verses here, you'll find that he's going to say, here's this line, here's this line, and each line by itself is like a proverbial statement because it's wisdom literature, not just a letter. So James is very unique, very unique. And if we don't approach it as wisdom literature, we're going to misinterpret what James is about. So therefore, that means that we all kind of have to work together here for a moment and figure out what on earth is wisdom literature all about? We're going to call this excursus number one. We're going to have several excursus over the next several months. Okay, but this is excursus number one. What on earth is wisdom literature? We've, I've, I've identified some for you. Book of Job, book of Proverbs. Okay, I've identified some for you. Song of Solomon. Isn't that a great one? We should do that as a study someday. <laughs> Good old sex book. <laughs> Wouldn't that just be fun as a series? Okay, and so <laughs> the Kama Sutra of the Bible. <laughs> we'll just see how that book goes. <laughs> so what we have is the book of James, wisdom literature. Here's what wisdom literature, if really going to face palm that one. <laughs> okay, here's what wisdom literature predominantly is all about. Wisdom literature has as its goal Setting up, figuring out how to 
live and thrive successfully in the universe God has created. That's what wisdom literature is about. It is about trying to deal with the meaning of existence. It tries to deal with the relationship between God and humanity. It tries to deal with instruction on how to live with skill this life. Okay, that's what wisdom literature predominantly is about. In fact, it has with it three levels, which I have for you here. Okay, on one level, level one, wisdom literature has within it about uh, knowledge and intelligence. Because you can't learn skills without knowing how to do something. Okay, if you are a skilled sailor, yes, you've learned by experience, but you have knowledge of. The boat, the tackle, the lines, the, the, everything involved with sailing, how to read the weather, the waves, when to, how to work with all that. There's knowledge, intelligence involved in that. Then at level two, okay, level two is predominantly about having good sense, okay? It's, it's like a type of discernment there. And th from that good sense, from that discernment, we are then able to act rightly in the long term, not the short term. Okay, that's what wisdom literature wants to teach. How to make decisions knowing that it's going to take a year to receive the fruit of your labor, not just make a decision because it benefits you now. I know a lot of people in a lot of dating relationships that need to have better sense. And they look at just the short term. They don't look at the long term. This is why I, I'm constantly wanting to teach my daughter that if there's no Jesus, no job, there's no joining. Okay, because I want her to think not just, well, we love each other, well, he's hot, whatever. I want her to think long term. Okay, good looks only go so far, and one day he will become ugly. That is what happens. Okay, <laughs> the best he will ever look is on his wedding, and it's downhill from there. That's just what's going to happen. Okay, a unless he's one of those mutants that belong with Charles Xavier, like Sean Connery, who, by the way, looks like a zombie now. Okay, even the hot Sean Connery. I speak that not from personal opinion. <laughs> okay, uh, though the hot Sean Connery or Piers Brosnan or other or Russell Crowe, my mom swoons at him. <laughs> okay, despite all, uh, one day <laughs> they all will get ugly. Okay, it will happen that we need to think long term. Okay, I am so glad my wife has vision long term. <laughs> that's why she married me. <laughs> you know, I, um, and that's why I married, I mean, it's, it's thinking long term. That's what wisdom literature wants to teach. The skill for discernment building so that decisions can be made in the long run rather than just the short run. Okay, then there's a third level. And this level is very deep. Okay, philosophically, ethically, morally, it's very, very deep. And a lot of people, once I start mentioning what's involved in this third level, you're going to say, ooh, are we going to get answers today? The answer is not today, but within the next three months, yes. Okay, and so I'm just going to tease you with what the third level is about. And that is the capacity to consider the problems of human life. And when we talk about the capacity of the problems of human life, I'm not talking about just how do I better budget, how do I deal with conflict, though all of that is talked about. Okay, those tend to fall in category number two, better communication, better relationship building habits, better budgeting, better, okay, all that's level two. Level three, call them profound problems, profound problems, the problems that irk us from the depths of our soul. Like, for example, if God is good, surely he would want to do away with evil. If God is all-powerful, surely he could, but yet there is evil. Why? Okay, this becomes one of the problems. If God says that all his justice will indeed reign, and the wicked will suffer, and that the judgment will reign upon this earth, what about the innocent who suffer? How does that fit in? Why is it there's collateral damage with that? As Israel gets sent into dispersion, not all of them were wicked. There was always a remnant who were faithful and suffered under God's wrath too. Those are the problems of human life wisdom literature wants to tackle. Those are the things that James is going to want to tackle. Have your attention now. Okay, those are, you see how those are different than just, oh dear me, my spouse and I had a fight. 
We're dealing stuff that's at the core of our worldview and understanding of our existence. Is God truly good? Is God really powerful? Is he really in control? And if so, why is so much so bad? And we can say it's the fall. We can say it's sin. But then we're, what are we saying? God's not involved? Is God out there disinterested? He's not intervening. And then some people try to sound like a Hallmark greeting card. Well, you see, God has a plan in it. Not every evil has a plan. Evil is evil, and it is random, and God does not cause evil because God is good, and evil is the opposite of God, and never am I going to look at someone who has been abused, who has been tortured, who has been raped, who has been molested, who has to look in the face of death and say, this was God's plan for you, because what it is is they have experienced evil, and they need to be told that this is wicked. And this was not in God's plan. Well, God could turn all things for good, and he's going to turn this and make it good. Is that really, really going to be our answer to the hurting? Because not all good things come from everything. Yes, God can do great things and has brought many roses from many thorn bushes. But it doesn't mean that he is saying, I want you to be tortured so that you can do this good thing. It's not part of that plan. So then why did it happen? This is what James is wanting to tackle. This is what wisdom literature is about. If you want answers to all these questions, read wisdom literature. Read Job, read Proverbs, read Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, read James. Okay? They will give you those insights. Not all, but they will give you some good sense, knowledge, and intelligence so that you have the capacity to consider, not have the absolute answer, but the capacity to consider the problems. Many of us, we haven't even considered them. For some of us, just what I have mentioned had been stuff for you that you've never even thought of. You know, maybe you've been those Hallmark Christians where you just go with someone and someone's hurting, you just say, you know what, I'll just say a prayer for you and I'm going to leave and hope that someone smarter can come your way. Or I'm going to tell you that, oh, God has a plan for everything and all, all things to those who wait. And you just throw out like hallmark statements and it happens to be scripture. And now to hear that those aren't necessarily the answers, now maybe you're able to begin to consider that there's a problem. That there's something wrong with our world. Okay, there's something wrong. God made it good, and yet something is wrong. And it's real easy to say, well, it's sin. And though that may, it is indefinitely accurate, does that really solve the answer? We can say, well, Jesus is the answer. Well, yeah, Jesus is the answer. Jesus comes to forgive sin, but yet we still have sin. So what do we do? Okay, this is wisdom literature. This is what it's about. And we're going to be exploring some of those issues actually today. Today is predominantly about enduring life amidst, amidst trials. Trying to actually weather the storm. That's what today's about. That's how James starts. I love this. You ready for this? James just begins. James, servant of Jesus. Two, people in dispersion. Greetings. Greetings. Verse 2, consider it great joy, my brothers, whenever you experience various trials. I'd like to smack him for that verse. <laughs> We're going to come back to that verse, trust me. <laughs> we need to spend time there, okay? Consider it a great joy, my brothers, whenever you experience various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance, but endurance must do its complete work so that you may be mature and complete, lacking nothing. Okay, it almost sounds like he's going Yoda here for a little bit. Okay, uh, life produces trials, trials produces endurance, endurance produces maturity. Hmm? Okay. <laughs> it almost seems like that's what he's doing here. It has that type of a build to it. But I want you to notice something about these verses. 
And I just want to point this out just because we're here and we're ready and we can handle this. And those, there are certain things that we think God promises that he never does. And I want to point those out. God never promises it will get better. Notice what it says, to endure the trials. Not that the trials are going to be removed. God never promises that it's going to get better. And this is where the Hallmark Christians come into play, always saying something along the lines of, you know, it's, it's hard now, but it's going to get better. You'll see God is faithful and it will get better. I always love it how we say that to people when there's nothing to back that up. And that is not the case. And then how many of you have ever had that spoken to you? And then a week later, a month later, you want to go find that person, sit them down and tell them it's not getting better. In fact, it's getting worse. Okay, what do you talk? Where, what do you mean? Are you telling me God's not faithful to me? You see, there's the problem when we start putting promises in the mouth of God that he never spoke. We mess up the, rea the reality and the reliability of God. Because okay, God is faithful, but it does not mean that everything in this life will get better. Another way of looking at it would be this. Did life get better for Jesus as he lived on this earth? No. no. Okay, it ended up to the point that he was innocently arrested, beaten, tortured, and died. And that's the son of God, okay? And he lived a life being rejected by his family, being rejected and ridiculed by his brothers, being called mentally unstable, being lied to, being betrayed, having people seek out to hurt him, to belittle him, to hurt, to, to kill him. The people sought out conspiracies against him all throughout his ministry. And it kept getting worse. And let me ask you something. Are you better than Jesus? No. And so why do we think we are going to somehow get preferential treatment greater than Jesus? Okay, if anything, if we're going to live a life like Jesus, we can expect a life of trials. Okay, we can expect that. So that's number one. We're going to revisit this in a moment, but that's number one. A second thing God never promises. God never promises all the answers. He never promises all the answers. What God does say is this, look to me, not to the answers. God wants you to look to him, not to the answers. Why rely on philosophy and knowledge when you can rely upon God? I'm not talking about being ignorant. I'm saying that we can spend so much time looking for answers to something that we completely miss the God of whom the answer rests upon. And we need to be about him rather than just simply coming up with answers for every single question. Paul, later on, ends up saying something to the effect of that we all know in part, but not in full. Okay, that we are indeed ignorant and we're not going to see everything. We're not going to see everything. We're not going to understand everything. We're going to have questions with absolutely no answers, and we're going to have to be okay with that. We're going to have to say, God, I'm going to trust you whether or not I understand everything. I, we can understand some things. We can get answers for some things. The Bible has many answers within it. There are 66 books filled with many, many answers, but not every answer is in there. Because not every answer, is a, is there, not every question has an answer to which we can even come up with. We just aren't going to know everything. We can know a lot, but not all. Okay, we can know a lot and not all. And even when we die and we end up on the new earth, we still won't know everything we won't be hindered by sin regarding our knowledge and memory. How many of you have a hard time remembering things that you learn? <laughs> right? You learn something and you forget it like five minutes later. Apparently, I get taught things several times by my wife and I still forget. <laughs> I look forward to the new earth when she can tell me something and I will remember it. 
she looks forward to that day too. <laughs> okay, and here's the th- some people try to teach that we will have all knowledge when we go on to the new earth. And here's why this isn't true. Who has perfect knowledge? God, and we will never be equal to him, not even on the new earth. So we will always be lacking in knowledge. And God loves it when we learn. I think that's one of the reasons Jesus came as a baby and had to grow up and had to learn because there's such joy in learning and growing and in developing. There's such a neat thing that happens there. The problem is sin screws us up in the process. And to go on the new earth and to live there for all everlasting life and to be able to not be hindered by sin and learn, oh my word, the things we can think. It would be just amazing. But until then, even then, we're not going to have like every answer. We're going to have to keep growing and learning and growing and learning. We will understand kind of in full in that we will have nothing hindering us, but we're still going to have to learn it. We're still going to have to grow in it. And in this life, in this world, we're definitely not going to have all the answers. And we have to be okay with that. And let me just flat out point this out. Many pastors in our American society lie about trials because they don't tell you that it's going to happen. They don't ask those questions that are the profound problems of human existence. If anything, they do something like this. Do you feel like something is missing in your life? Then you need to come to Jesus so you can go to heaven. And that's it. They don't tell you that life stinks between now and then. What they don't tell you is, they tell you, well, Jesus will remove all your problems and Jesus will forgive all your sins and everything will be made right in Christ. And this is true, but the theologians tell you something more honest. We call that death. Jesus will make it all right. He will fix everything after you die. (laughs) They leave that part out. When I had somebody coming to me trying to recruit me for the kingdom of God and they're treating me like, like a potential soldier for the army, okay, and they're coming at me, they're trying to recruit me, they're telling me all this great fluffy stuff, but what they aren't telling me is that I have to die to get it all. <laughs> that I'm not gonna get it in this life right now. I might get some reward, some benefit, but I'm going to definitely have a hard, hard life. Another way of looking at it would be this, that at the beginning of existence, when God made Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve got to eat from the tree of life. At the end of the Bible, in Revelation, Adam and uh, all humanity, whoever is there that are saved and bought of the blood of Jesus Christ, that will be there. All of the different ethnicities will be there that are, that are saved, will be on the new earth, and will be able to eat from the tree of life. So at the beginning of the Bible, tree of life, end of the Bible, tree of life, but what we are dealing with is life in between the trees, where there isn't really good thriving life, where we experience pain, suffering, and death. That's where we're living, in between the trees. And many pastors don't talk about that. They point you to the trees, but they don't tell you how to deal with the in-between. And that's where we find ourselves, is in the in-between. So I, I applaud James. He's a pastor, and he's honest. Because he says, you're going to endure trials, and that's how he starts his letter. <laughs> Okay, he starts verse two after the salutation and greetings. He says, life's going to be hard. Okay, that's how he starts, and I applaud him for that. Very much applaud him that he is very honest with his letter. He is very honest about the trials. Now, Let's start asking some of the more difficult questions according to James, according to what we are able to read from verses two through four. Why is it that trials exist? What is going on concerning trials? And from there, we can see how to respond to trials in verses five through eight. And then we can go back to verse two and figure out that whole, I want to smack you, James, joy part. Okay, (laughs) so that's what we're going to do for this. So why is it that trials exist? And I do, James does seem to indicate to view trials as being normative. In other words, it is simply a part of life. 
expect it to be normal. Many Christians view trials as being abnormal. Something hits them and they're surprised. Why is this happening to me? Oh, woe is me. This is going hard. I think I'm going to fall off my chair, go into a fetal position, read the book of Job and the book of Lamentations and cry out to God saying, you've forsaken me. And we're all surprised. We were completely taken off guard by it. And James points out to say, life is going to be hard and that's normal. Don't be surprised when trials come. Don't think that because something is bad happening to you, that is punishment. Don't think that it is something that someone is out to get you. Don't think that it, it's normal. It's normal, and it is indeed part of life. Here's the other part that will be equally as comforting for you. <laughs> is that it is also part of God's permissive will. Now, there's going to be a little bit of theology for you. Let me kind of back this up. It is helpful and is very constructive to kind of view God as having at least two wills. Absolute will and permissive will. Okay, that it's, it's very helpful. And it, some theologians go into saying that God has three, he has four, whatever. You know, I'm not going to get into all that debate. But we know that he has at least two wills. His absolute will and his permissive will. Absolute will means that there is stuff that is a part of God's will that will absolutely happen. It will absolutely, God intervenes 100%. He is in control. He is the sovereign one. He is the almighty creator, alpha, omega God. And there are things that will absolutely happen. It is his absolute will. Stuff like salvation by faith through grace because of the work of Jesus on the cross and Jesus rising again. Okay, those were absolutely going to happen. The Jesus' second return and the rebuilding and the recreation, the, the new heavens and the new earth absolutely will happen. You see? Okay, that's his absolute will. Then there's his permissive will. This is where he permissively, with his permission, chooses not to intervene. This is where God basically says that I am going to allow this to take place. I am not going to stop it. It is not part of the absolute will. God is not saying I ordained this suffering to happen. He simply says I'm going to allow this to happen. And that is his permissive will. And it's really hard for us to deal with his permissive will because we want there to be an answer there. Why did you allow this to happen? God's answer tends to be, I allowed it to happen. Okay, and we expect there to be some puzzle piece that we can find, some little Greek term we can manipulate and rotate, some little concept that we can somehow formulate that will give us some great little secret inside knowledge as to the whys of his permissive will. When God just goes, it's my permissive will, you're going to deal with it or not? It's his permissive will. He allowed it to happen. And so one way to think about it would be this. Here's another way of, of approaching this issue. Not every reward and not every judgment will happen in this lifetime. Not every reward and not every judgment will be experienced in this lifetime. God's absolute will says that he will absolutely set the record straight and that the evil will be punished and the righteous will be rewarded but it is not his absolute will for that to happen in this lifetime. It will happen after this lifetime. Absolutely true. It will indeed one day happen, but he does not absolutely promise it to be in this lifetime. So therefore, there are some people that live like hell on earth and they reject God and reject everything about God and they seem to thrive in this world. They have blessings upon blessings, it seems like. They got financial success. They got item materialistic success. They got families, and they, or they do so much. 
And they got everything, but they seem to be wanting nothing to do with God, but they got everything everybody wants. Let me just tell you that if they don't accept Christ, that life is the closest to heaven they will ever get. And then you look at the Christian who follows God and they're faithful and they're poor and they're in poverty and they're working to try to make ends meet and everything's falling apart around them and the car breaks down and their house begins to leak and they, their, their kids run rampant and everything just seems to be falling apart and they don't understand what's going on. And they're like, God, I'm trying to follow you to the best of my ability, but this is getting so hard, so difficult. Let me just tell you that with this understanding of his permissive will, that this suffering that you're experiencing is the closest to hell you will ever get. Okay, you see how this works. Not every reward, not every judgment is given out in this lifetime, but it is coming. And for those apart from Christ, this is the best it will ever get for them. And for those that are suffering innocently now, this is the worst it's ever going to get. And it's going to be amazingly beautiful afterwards because you got the absolute will of God the Father over you coming, giving you rewards like you can never imagine. And we just have to make it between the trees. Okay, so he has his absolute will and he has his permissive will. He gives permission for things to happen. He does not intervene. But absolutely one day he will set the record straight. And there is extreme encouragement in that. I want you to hear that, that there is hope that is within that. In the meantime, how do we handle these trials? That's what James gives us in these first couple of verses. He says basically the, this sentence, the trials are a test. Did you, did you see that? that God allows it to happen and one insight for handling those issues is that they are a test. By the way, this is great encouragement because we all know how wonderful tests are. (laughs) Here's why I find it encouraging, okay? Now, how many of you love final exams when you were in college or the end test when you were in school? That was just your favorite. Okay, we have two people that are sick in the head and that's quite all right. Okay, here's the good news. You do not get a test for a class you have not enrolled in. Okay, you do not get a test for a class that you have not enrolled in. So if life a sucketh for you, welcome to the class. (laughs) Okay, (laughs) welcome to class. But they are a test. The purpose of a test is that it becomes, every test is an opportunity. I know, we didn't see, I didn't see that in college. I view tests as an evidence of the fall and that my teacher was wicked. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I saw it, okay? Oh, look, I was at a seminary. Oh, look at this test. This shows that my, my teacher is not saved. <laughs> you know, I, I, I was like, this is evidence of evil right here. This is terrible. Okay, but I did not view tests as an opportunity. James calls it an opportunity. An opportunity for what? Maturity. An opportunity to show yourself to show God, to show your friends, to show your family, to show anyone who knows you, can see you, they can show you who you are in Christ. Tests, these trials are tests, they are an opportunity for you to show who you are in Christ and who you are becoming in Christ. To show the world that Jesus makes a difference. That while the trials come for the good and the wicked, rain falls on the good and the wicked, hard times come to everybody, whether we realize it or not. Okay, hard times come upon everybody. The Christian can show the world who they are in Christ and who they are becoming in Christ. They are an opportunity to show that. 
So when a trial comes your way, you know it's going to be rough, you know it's going to be hard, and you are now given an opportunity. You are now given an opportunity to show endurance, to show maturity. In fact, the word endurance that James uses when he says that, brothers, whenever you experience trials, know that the testing of your faith produces endurance. Okay, that word endurance literally means, here's from the Greek dictionary for you, that word means the capacity to hold out or to bear up in the face of difficulty. That's what the word endurance means. That's the word that James is using here. Okay, that you have the capacity to hold out or to bear up in the face of difficulty. In other words, let's say you got a job and it's hard, so you quit. You get another job and you get sore and it's hard, so you quit. You get another job and it quits. You go to it and, and you quit that job too. Then you go to church and you have a conflict and so you drop out. You go to school and you fail a test, so you drop out. You know what you end up doing and what you're not doing? You're not maturing. Because you're not enduring. And that's what James is referring to here. That you cannot mature as a Christian, you cannot mature in Christ without steadfastness, without holding your ground, without persevering. You cannot mature, you cannot mature without endurance. And you cannot at all work with endurance or persevering or holding your ground unless something is trying to shake you from it. So every trial that comes is partially there to help you mature. Part of why God allows what he allows is to help you grow up. To help you mature. Why does it have to be so stinking hard? Because we're so stinking stubborn. <laughs> we persevere more in our sin than we do in our faithfulness. So we have to get a stronger storm to shake us from that. To stop being so stubborn and start being faithful. And as we're faithful, guess what? The storms are going to get harder. Why? Because we're showing faithfulness. And now we can handle the harder storms. So if you think, well, if I just don't mature, maybe the storms, no, the storms will get worse to shake you. Well, if I'm faithful, the storms will go away. No, the storms are going to be there because God's excited about how far you're going to grow. So either way, you get to that fork in the road, you're going to have a storm over the road either way. Either you can take the road that says I'm going to be obedient to Christ and be faithful or disobedient and unfaithful. Either way, the, the roads are flooded. Pick your path. And James says, pick the path of faithfulness. Because at least by the time you get to the end of the path, there's a helicopter. <laughs> and the other side, you drown. Either way, you got the storm waters. James goes on in verse 5. And on to verse eight, and he talks about prayer. It's very interesting how he mentions this prayer here in verse five. He says this, now if any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God, who gives to all generously and without criticizing, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith without doubting, for the doubter is like the surging sea driven and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. An indecisive man is unstable in all his ways. Hear the proverbial sounding in that? Okay, James is wisdom literature. Just, just know that up front. Now, because of time, we're going to have to cover some of this last part of that next week. What I want to be able to cover is this issue of the prayer that he's talking about because it is taken so out of context so often. And in fact, I made a list of my top 10 most out of context verses. I don't have them in order, but I got my 10 verses. This is one of them. Okay, counting a great joy is another one that we're going to be talking about here in just a few minutes. But with this prayer thing, it's interesting to note that when dealing with trials, notice at what order prayer is listed in. Second. Isn't that interesting? James talks about endurance first. Persevere first, prayer second. And I find that very curious. And, and it really rings true because the best defense that a Christian has to trials is their maturity. 
And out of that maturity comes prayer. Out of that maturity comes prayer. Because here's what I tend to find. The immature Christian may indeed pray, but all their prayer is is, is complaining in prayer form. It's not true submit to the will of the Lord prayer. It is, God, you're a genie in a bottle, and I'm going to pray to you hoping that I'm rubbing the lamp the right way so you'll come out and go, poof, what do you want? Okay, and, and that's how they tend to pray. God, do this. God, do that. God, do this. God, do that. And it's very untheological. Okay, and they don't use prayer as, as what it's supposed to be used for. Now, regarding this, they say if you pray and you lack wisdom ask God who are willing to give you anything notice it's not the removal of trials it is wisdom which is how to handle it through the trials it is God I am not sure how to make it I am not sure what to do help me have discernment help me to be if nothing else faithful to you which by the way is wisdom the word wisdom that James is using here is actually literally means to maintain your relationship with God. So the prayer is, God, I want to maintain my relationship with you. I want to be faithful to you through this storm. And I am lacking that. Help me. And God will give. And God will help you to obey him in the storm. It is not delete the storm, remove the storm, take me from the storm. It's God, help me to obey you while I'm in this storm. That's the wisdom James is talking about here. And pray, asking God to give you that wisdom, and he is quick indeed to give you that wisdom in abundance. And by the way, this wisdom that you are supposed to be asking for comes from knowledge. In other words, the reason why the person with doubt is un unfaithful and is tossed back and forth is because that means it's a person who says, God, help me to have knowledge to better follow you and obey you, but they never read the Bible. They don't dig into the Bible. They only turn to it when there's a problem, so they turn to the back of the Bible and like a life application or something, looking up a topic that fits their situation, going to that verse, no attention to context, no attention to the, to the steady growth of constant work of maturity. It's like going to a boxing match without any training. You know, could you imagine if the Golden Glove competition came to Grand Rapids again and I decided to show up? <laughs> and you laugh. Okay, and then, knowing that it's a year out, I don't prepare. Okay, I, I had a, a, an indication of this recently. My wife and I are doing something in Grand Rapids called the Foam Fest. It, it's, it's a 5K run, and, and I've never, I've, I've done 5K runs before in, in, in high school. You know, that was 30 years ago, it seems like almost, okay? It was a long time ago, and so now I'm like, oh my goodness, First, I feel really old right now. 20 years ago, so that doesn't help. <laughs> okay, and, and so first I feel very, very, because 20 years ago I was graduated from high school, okay? So <laughs> I was already done. But, okay, now yesterday I was at a family reunion and I tossed a football for a good hour. My arm is thinking useless today. And that was not running a 5K with foam sprayed at me with dirt to crawl through and hills to climb over. And I mean, it's insane nuts. Uh, I think I should be committed for even agreeing to sign up for this thing. But it let me know that I cannot show up on the day of the foam fest and say, God, help me run this well. And God's going to go, you're funny. <laughs> You've known about this for how many months and you haven't run in advance. You haven't practiced. You haven't prepared. And now you want my, what do you want me to do? Grow, like do you like Captain America? Pfft, look at you, you're all buff now. That's not gonna happen. John, you're funny. That's why I made you. This is gonna be a great hour. <laughs> I wanna watch you hurt. <laughs> it's gonna be funny. Okay, and, and that's, that's what James is referring to. Are, there are so many people that say, well, I believe God makes a difference. I believe that the Bible has answers. But then they don't read the Bible. 
They turn to their own expertise. They turn to their own knowledge about whatever life. They turn to Dr. Phil. They turn to Oprah. They turn to Google. <laughs> they go and they say, I have a problem in life. Do I have an app for that? Yeah, it's called a Bible app. Download it. It's free. <laughs> Read the Bible. Okay, and so it, it, that's part of what James is getting at here. Okay, you, you got to make good judgment. Good judgment comes from good knowledge, and that good knowledge is going to come from Scripture. Learn it, grow in it, develop in it, so that when trials come, you can handle it. It doesn't mean it's going to be easy and it's going to be fun. It's going to stinketh greatly, and no one may buy to the odor thereof, but doggone it, you're going to be able to be obedient in it. So that when it's all said and done, we can all count it joy. <laughs> what type of joy is this? Okay, I'll, I'll be honest with you. This is where we're going to conclude. This is our last point here for today. Uh, we've been through a great already mission, haven't we? <laughs> okay, now, counting it joy. I tell you the truth uh, that I hear this misquoted all the time from those righteous, pious people that inspire me to want to do violence upon them. They come to me when I'm suffering. They say, we should just count it joy. Yeah, I'm going to give you a five-finger discount on joy. You're just standing right there. You know, you do telling me like that. You know, you know, and, and, and what they tend to think is that somehow that this joy means that we should all be happy. And they say that, they'll even quote James almost in context. They'll say, see, it's an opportunity. It's an opportunity to show how great Christ is, and you should be happy about that. You should count it joy that you have this opportunity. You should be glad to have this opportunity. Now, let me tell you something. Joy is not happiness. That is not what the word means. Joy is not happiness. Now, people misunderstand me here. I need to clarify something because I've gotten people mad at me about this. I am for happiness. Okay, people misunderstand me. If we were all taking a vote, I vote happy. Okay? <laughs> if we were taking a vote between sad and happy, I vote happy. I am totally for happiness. Okay? I, I really, really am. I just recognize that happiness is circumstance-based. I recognize the truth that happiness is circumstance-based. For example, you get a new job. Happy. Your boss calls in, your boss calls in sick. Happy. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I understand happiness. You know, my wife comes up to me and says, John, I want to make you gluten-free fried shrimp and give you a back rub. Happy. Just something for you to pray about. Um, <laughs> okay, happy. I, I vote happy. I really do. I vote for happy. I am, I'm right there for you on that. Okay, I, I really, really, really am. It's just that it, happiness is circumstance-based. Okay, it's circumstance-based. And what James is wanting us to have is something that is not based on circumstances, and it's not about being happy. Because here's another verse for you to kind of keep in mind. It's called Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. Looking unto, looking at Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Okay? Jesus, the Lord and Savior, the author of faith, the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him when he endured the what? The cross. Was Jesus happy about the crucifixion? No. No. Jesus did not go to get it. When he was arrested, he was not laughing. When he was being whipped and beaten, he was not smiling. Okay, he was not, in fact, he was so unhappy, unhappy about the crucifixion that before his arrest, Jesus knelt on the ground and he prayed to the point of sweating so hard that blood vessels bursted in his forehead and he prayed and he prayed and he said, Father, I want plan B. 
If there is any other way to do this, I vote yes. Okay, that's what Jesus wanted. He was like, I vote plan B. Yet, if this is the only way, then I'm doing it. I'm going to go through it. I'll go through this storm. But I would love an ulterior storm. I would love a storm shelter. I would love a bigger boat. I would love something other than this crucifixion. Jesus was not happy about it. In fact, he wanted out. And it was called for him joy. So when we hear that Paul says that when you face trials, consider it joy, it does not mean be glad about it. It does not mean look at it with great anticipation and excitement and happiness. In fact, a Christian that smiles and laughs that when pain comes their way, they're mentally unstable or they're faking it. Because it is not something to be happy about. And Jesus considered the cross joy, but it was not happy. It was very much hope. Joy means hope. Okay, that's the best definition in English I know, is that joy means hope. Hope and knowing that in the grander scheme of things, this pain is temporary. Even if the pain lasts your lifetime, like arthritis or some type of disease, you have the hope of knowing that it is indeed temporary. I know you say if it lasts all your entire life, it's not temporary, it's permanent. No, because if you're in Christ, when you die, it goes away. Remember, we're talking about between the trees, not beyond the second tree. Pain and suffering exist between the trees. Once you die, you go to be with Christ, if you're in Christ, and you go to the new heavens and the new earth. And there is that tree and beyond, that there is hope. There is also hope that you can indeed handle this trial in a way to show what Christ is like, that he is real and that he makes a difference. There is hope that you can indeed mature and grow and be obedient and faithful, that your children, that your neighbors and friends can follow suit and can try to mimic you. Like as Paul said, mimic me because I try to mimic Christ. Your children are gonna mimic you. And if they're mimicking God poorly, it could be that you're mimicking God poorly and that you need to handle your trials better. That you need to view it more through the eyes of hope rather than selfishness and, oh, woe is me, this is bad on me. It should be, God, how do I be faithful to you through this? What does it take? What can I do? And, that, and to live through it with hope to live through it with hope, knowing that this is not the end. God will one day set the record straight. This is not the last laugh. Sin does not get the last laugh. We can endure these trials through hope and with hope. And by the way, once you change joy to hope, it changes a lot changes a lot. First, the expectation of enjoying certain things in life can be removed, and that just takes a weight off the shoulders. And second, it begins to make certain songs have different meaning. You guys familiar with that great Christmas song, Joy to the World? Is that happiness to the world? Or is it, hey, world, have hope. Hope to the world for the Lord has come, let earth receive her king. It's about hope. It's about hope. 